Hello, and thank you for joining us on today's Firehouse.com webcast, Interoperability is More Than Just Radios. My name is Peter Matthews. I'm the editor of Firehouse.com, and I want to thank you all for joining us uh, for this program today uh, and taking the time to better understand what interoperability really means. Um, as our presenter, uh, Chief Peter Lamb, will lay out here over the next hour or so, it's a lot more than just being on the same channel uh, when you're at the same scene. Uh, today's presentation is being given by Chief Peter Lamb, who is a 35-year veteran of the fire service and has led three suburban fire departments. He has served in multiple capacities at the Massachusetts State Firefighting Academy and served as the Director of State Training. Chief Lamb has authored uh, articles for periodicals and has lectured nationally on a variety of topics, including tactics, incident command, training, and operations, and is a regular speaker at the Firehouse Expo for us in Baltimore. we will be there in just a couple of weeks. Uh, so if you're at Firehouse Expo, please stop by and see one of his programs. Uh, it's, it, they're, they're all outstanding. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to thank our sponsor. Sponsor for today's program, which is Verizon Wireless. When every second counts, having access to the data you need, the moment you need it, can make all the difference. That's why the powerful Verizon network enables wireless solutions that help firefighters across access critical information to manage situations more effectively and to stay safe. With a wide suite of solutions and the reliability of America's largest wireless network, Verizon can help stations respond more effectively than ever before. During the presentation, if you have any questions for Chief Lamb, please feel free to send them in. Uh, there's a box on your browser. Uh, just send them over and we'll take uh, a couple of points uh, throughout the program today to get to your questions. And without any further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Chief Peter Lim. Well, thank you, Peter. I, uh, I appreciate uh, Firehouse for having us, Verizon for being our sponsor, and certainly to all the firefighters that are out there taking a bit of their afternoon to uh, spend some time with us. We hear about interoperability an awful lot. Uh, primarily, it came about, and when people speak about the term, it's about radios, generally, uh, or most often it's about radios. Occasionally, we talk about the term interoperability. We need better oper interoperability. Well, when does that come up? It usually comes up after something has gone wrong. That's been my experience, and I think that's, uh, that's what we're here to talk about. We're not going to solve all the problems this afternoon, but we are certainly going to give you an overview. And I have a mission when I give a training session, something like this. We want you to have some takeaways. We don't want to identify a bunch of problems for you. We want to give you some real-life solutions and give you some takeaways that you can bring back to your individual department. Let's start with a common base. Let's get our definition. And you see my definition up there, just a Webster's definition. Diverse systems and organizations to work together. You know, we could go off on a whole conversation about just trying to get your own fire department, which is diverse and organized working together, but we're not going to do that. We're going to talk about mutual aid and those kinds of things. But I want you to think beyond the firefighter. I want you to think about your civilian dispatchers. I want you to think about your civilian admin people. Within your own organization, there is a form of interoperability. Is everybody working together? Are all of those puzzle pieces up in the corner, are they actually meshing together the way they should on a normal basis? So we'll touch on that just a little bit as we go. You know, radios and frequencies, I, I guess I, I, we're going to talk about equipment in just a few minutes, but I had to put this slide in there. You know, we need interoperability. We need this and we need that. Well, I think the question that I pose on the slide, at your last multiple alarm emergency, fire, storm, uh, tornado, hurricane, whatever it was, when was the last time that you wished that you had more folks on your radio frequency? Gee, I wish we had, you know, public works talking to us and people without the proper radio discipline or different, different sorts of, of information. The other thing that I think that I've learned in 35 years is that you never stop uh, learning. And I think one of the, the issues about uh, continuing to learn, if we look at the programs that are being offered today by Dr. Gassaway, situational awareness and all of that, what we're learning is that that radio for the commander is a blessing and a curse. So I'm not going to steal any of his thunder in programs that he does, but we don't need more people talking on our radio frequency. That may not be the best answer that we have. So we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. So really, Chief William, interoperable with who? What, what are we talking about? 
Well, here's a list, and there's certainly more people that I think uh, fit in this category. But, but my focus here this afternoon is going to be other fire departments, mutual aid departments, interoperable working with other mutual aid departments. But I also think we have to step it down a level and see how you fit. What is your interoperability within your own community or county or state organization, whatever level organization you have? I've tried to create this presentation so it fits from an individual fire protection district right up to a state agency. Um, how do you mesh with other state and local governments? And we'll, we'll identify some of those. Uh, how do you mesh with law enforcement? It's sad to say that in 2013, there are many departments that still have challenges. The, uh, the red and blue line is, is, uh, is very defined, and uh, not every agency has great cooperation, unfortunately. As I travel around the country, we hear stories all the time that that, that interagency within our own community is not as fluent as we would like it to be. And then what other civic groups, community organizations? Do you have, you know, extremely popular, do we have uh, your CERT organization, uh, community emergency response teams? Do you even interact with them? Do you even care about them? Are you the sponsor or is it another agency? Is it emergency management in your community? And FIRE really has never interacted or even dealt with them. So I want you to broaden your horizon. We're going to go a little bit beyond the, the fire department mutual aid. We're certainly going to talk about that a great deal. But I want you, as I speak, think about how this applies to everyone else that's on this slide and, and, and many more that we haven't even thought of or haven't even talked about. You know, we talk about interoperability. Is it just for emergencies? Um, what is, how could we use interoperability or the thought process for interoperability? How could we use that in a non-emergency setting? Well, I think this is where we're going to talk about a great deal about, you know, people say in, in times of emergency, you should meet people ahead of time. You should interact with people before the emergency. You should build relationships. Well, I think this really applies in the non-emergency setting. Can you get people with like-mindedness? Will they think like you think and begin the planning, the non-emergency planning uh, in, in that mode before you ever actually have to do that? And we'll give you a case history a little bit later on about how we did some planning locally in the non-emergency mode long before we needed it. And obviously, this, you know, the second bullet point is, you know, what's the, uh, what's the difference is be emergency, non-emergency? We use interoperability. Interoperability becomes important because we're saving time. I think, I think as first responders, fire service folks, time is what we fight on the fire ground. Smooth, uh, effective, interoperable operations, if you will, not just radio use, but operations, will save time and efficiency. And I think that that's, uh, that's certainly something that we need to look at. I think that's something that we will discuss as we move along. I'm using this methodology as we go forward here this afternoon, and any good instructor is supposed to tell you their, their teaching objectives. Well, here's my teaching objective. I want you to think a little differently at, at an hour from now than you do right now about interoperability. That's my goal. That's my objective. So we'll see if we can hit that. But I'm going to break the talk that we're going to do today into these categories. People, procedures, equipment, and unified command. And this slide really represents one of my very first takeaways for you in your department. If you were trying to solve a problem in your department, whether it's the maintenance division, the training division, tactical operations, whatever it happens to be, I want you to break it down into those three primary categories, people, procedures, and equipment. And as you begin to analyze those three things, they impact every facet of your fire operation, EMS operation, or whatever it is you're doing. And you can take that away. We're going to use it here this afternoon for the purposes of this training. But you can certainly take those concepts away and use them in any facet of, of where you're having a problem within your organization. And I'm really a fan of unified command. And we're going to talk about whether or not we're doing it right or whether we're just paying it lip service. We're going to spend some time talking about that, certainly. Now, 
why does it get um, why does it become different in a small organization versus a large organization? As you look around the country, there is an FDNY, a Chicago, a Los Angeles, you know, the Dallas, the Houston. There are dozens of large fire organizations right here in Massachusetts, where I'm from, Boston, large organization. But there are, you know, there are dozens of those. There are thousands of small fire protection districts and fire departments, suburban departments throughout the country. The smaller organization may not be able to support itself and therefore rely on outside resources, whether that's intra-community or inter-community. The smaller organization, this is going to apply to much, at a much greater level just because of sheer size. Uh, it becomes a resource game. Whether the resource I'm talking about happens to be apparatus or people, it is a resource game. And the smaller the organization, there may be, there may be challenges uh, with that. So we need to think about that. Let's look at the first factor we talked about. We said we're going to break it into thirds, so let's talk about the people factors that come up. I want you to, again, as you look at these slides, you think about your own organization first, and then you think outside your organization to your surrounding mutual aid situations. What are your training standards? Do you have any physical standards? Are there any manning factors, apparatus manning? What, you know, small volunteer departments? Well, we might get two guys, we might get five guys, depending on day, guys and gals. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be specific, guys and gals. You get two folks on the apparatus or five, uh, that makes a difference. In some uh, career departments, there may be collective bargaining agreements that decide how many uh, personnel go on each apparatus. Those will make a difference. And then, of course, in the fire service, we have all sorts of specialized training that comes into play. So these are the factors that we're going to look at within your own department and outside the boundaries of your own department. Boy, there's a question. We could, we could have a webinar on this one slide for a long time. Are all firefighters created equal? Are there differences even on your own groups or shifts, whatever you happen to call them, groups, shifts, platoons, different departments call them different things, which brings me to a point much later on, but I digress. Uh, you know, I joined a, one of the departments that I was involved with had a four platoon system, and we had three fire stations. And when I arrived, I said, gee, this is going to be like running 13 departments. And everybody said, well, don't be ridiculous. It's four, sta you know, four platoons, three stations. That's 12. And I said, no, 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 13 is what I believe is going on. That's the 13th piece of that puzzle. Uh, we know, even within our own department, not every shift, despite your best procedures, will do things exactly like the other shift. That's where we need to start here. There's no question. That's where this, if you're serious about this topic, and you must be because you're taking time out of your day to be here, that's where this has to start. We talk about, you know, in the morning, uh, well, we're going to do a rotation. It's my group of firefighters. I'm the shift commander. It's John's turn to be on the ladder truck, and it's Fred's turn to do this, and Sarah's going over to the ambulance, or whatever it happens to be. I have a story one night where we took our best uh, and, and by accident, we took our best air consumption guy, the guy who could wear an air pack better than anyone in the job, and we put him with someone who maybe is not the best person wearing an air pack. We sent a two-man team in to do an assignment, and so eight minutes later they're outside because somebody's on low air or what have you. We don't even think these kinds of decisions during the day. Sometimes we talk about making assignments and, and doing things because of procedure, sometimes we get caught up in our own procedures and we're not really thinking about the, you know, interoperable has the word operable in the middle of it. How operable are we? And can we make things, you know, putting all the same folks, put your heavy, uh, uh, you know, folks that are super with their packs, put them in one place, use them to your, to your maximum. Uh, so there's even simple things on a day-to-day -day basis we can do when we start talking about making our own organization interoperable. You know, a great picture in the bottom right corner. You've got a strike team, an engine strike team, five like resources, exactly identical or what have you. 
I don't know what goes on certainly in your areas, but I guess in some questions, in some parts of the country, and certainly in the Northeast to some regard, that is not the case. I know that under NIMS we've got resource typing and all those sorts of things and everything is supposed to be in that. We have the right guidelines. I just am not sure that we're able to do that in practice as well as the guideline might, might allow. I mean, I certainly think about this. If you say, you know, your second alarm engine company, you've got a large fire emergency going on, and you say, send me an engine for a, a rapid intervention team or a fast team, whatever the, the verbiage is in your, in your geographic area, if a two-person engine company showed up, is, is that a RIT team? Uh, does that give you the RIT team that you thought or you anticipated when you made the call? Now, obviously, we pre-plan some of this and we pre-designate companies for certain things. No question about that. But sometimes in the heat of an emergency, if you haven't thought about this, you've got to speak about what that manning capability is of that company because that's going to, you know, you might have exactly the same engine company or ladder company, and if you change the personnel on it, you certainly change the capabilities. So interoperability from a manning perspective is important, and we'll talk about how some of those, those decisions can be made ahead of time. You know, from, from an EMS side, you know, we, have, we talk about fire operations and all that, even routine EMS. Uh, there are departments that run uh, paramedic ambulances. That means, in some jurisdictions, two paramedics. There are departments that run paramedic companies with three paramedics on a transporting ambulance. And there are some jurisdictions that allow a paramedic and a basic to still provide advanced life support and be licensed as such. So when you say you want an ALS ambulance, what is it you're really getting? Now again, geography plays a part. Some, some parts of the country this is very well defined and it's two paramedics all the time and that's the answer. And that's wonderful because it solves some of the problems of interoperability. But when you try to do a webinar that's as broad-based as what we're doing, we need to think about every department, the large and the small, in all areas of the country. So it's, uh, we wanted to bring that consideration up. What is the level of training? And, and I'm a training guy by, at heart, so people, people will know that if they, they are familiar with me. But this makes a difference. What is your base level of training? And I'll just recount a story uh, from my past, and, and you can take this for what it is. We know that there is a minimum consensus standard for training. Uh, level one and two, firefighter one and two is pretty much the norm, and that's something um, that, that we, we accept. The NFPA has set down a minimum guideline. There are situations where, and I know this from, from real life, you can get a Firefighter 1-2 certificate in as low as 20 hours. You can have 135 hours of training. And you can have 495 hours of training. All coming up with a level 1 and 2 certification, quote unquote, air quotes present when I say that, you can come up with this certification. The question is, what is the level of training, comma, level of training and experience. So training levels may, may be one thing, but also experience has to consider in. Now, if, if you're a large city and you have to rely on a smaller department next to you, it, you, you know, maybe there are training differences. I don't care about the training differences as much as I care about you understanding what they are, knowing what they are, and being able to use those the, you know, either gaps or superior training, uh, do they have special resources that you don't have, uh, that, that may be important. What is the continuing training like within your own department? Have you, you know, if you have a training division and you're a large organization, you may have this issue resolved pretty easily. Uh, it, it's pretty simple. But if your shift commanders are giving training on a routine basis, um, is it consistent? Is it consistent? The point of trying to get interoperability is, is my last bullet on this slide, and that is you should, after listening to this seminar, go back and you know, write down the gaps. That, that's what we're identifying. We're doing a little bit of a gap analysis here so that we can see what the gaps are and we're able to, uh, to move forward. 
You know, we talked about outside your agency from a training perspective and people perspective. Um, training with live, like, training with police, uh, bringing your firefighters to when they go and qualify. Let them listen to live gunfire. Let them see the effects of pepper spray when they train on one another. Um, uh, talking about your Department of Health, does your fire department, if you are an EMS department, or even, even if you're not, are you training with your local Department of Health or State Department of Health for pandemic, uh, emergency dispensing sites, all of those kinds of things where you're going to be forced to interact if there is a large-scale medical emergency? Uh, have you trained with your military civil support teams uh, and what their capabilities are? Putting the fire department, you know, often I, I chuckle, I have a, a sense of humor which is either good or bad depending on who you speak to, but, you know, we call ourselves a paramilitary organization. Take your paramilitary organization and bring in a military civil support team unit and see if you're working the same way. See if the interoperability is really there with a military organization. And I think uh, you'll find that out. So these are just a couple of quick tips. You know, who, who should you train with outside your agency and for what types of emergencies? That's something you can take a look at uh, while you're doing it. Specialized training, you know, it's the hazmat team. It's the high angle rescue team. It's all of those things. And I think any of you who are aware of Gordon Graham and all of his teachings, it's these high-risk, low-frequency events. And in a very small fire department, the high-risk, low-frequency event might be the structure fire. It, it can be that way in so many cases. Uh, and so these specialized teams must train together. You know, I, I, I listened to an emergency probably five or six months ago, so in the, uh, another community I was listening to a, a radio situation, and they had a high-angle rescue. And they called a specialized high-angle rescue team. And after the fact, I was discussing it, and it was kind of one of those slap-your-forehead moments. If you're going to call for a high-angle rescue team, call for two of them. Who is the RIT team for that high-angle rescue team? You've decided it's beyond your resources, so you're calling for a specialized rope rescue team. You, you better get another specialized rope rescue team that knows one another's capabilities because, you know, we think RIT team for fires. RIT team is a, is a lot more than that. When you're talking about a hazmat team and a bunch of people going in level A suits, you better have a bunch of other people standing by in level A suits with the same capability. So training with these specialized units has got to go beyond your, go outside the boundaries of your department as well. It's certainly important. So that's kind of the people. That's a, kind of a brief overview of the people portion of this. Let's look at the uh, procedural things. Are there any standard operating procedures that are in common with another department? More important than that question, have you even looked? Have you sat down and reviewed procedures? Now, there's a, you know, there's a ton of ways to do review of standard operating procedures. Get a couple of ship commanders, get some representatives from the rank and file, uh, chief officers, whatever, there's a hundred ways to do that. But not only do it within your own department, which can be a mon monumental task, but certainly do it with departments around you. Uh, look at your police department's procedures, policies, term, uh, terminology. Uh, radio procedures. Uh, I was just called to, to do some training in another department. There are multiple fire districts within one community. Everybody's using plain text, and one of, somebody has now decided that they're going to use radio codes. How, how do you fix that? I mean, it's not working. Somebody's going to make a mistake. And then we'll talk about some command stuff a little bit later on. We're going to spend some time doing, doing that. I would say this. Here's another action item from today's webinar. We looked, when we looked at our mutual aid situation, we tried to look at our second alarm, third alarm, fourth alarm, and we stopped at a fifth alarm. After a fifth alarm, it's been my personal experience that training procedures and a lot of stuff may not matter at that point because things are, uh, things are going downhill pretty rapidly and, and the command structure is going to have to sustain itself at some point uh, uh, that's beyond the planning phase in most cases. You can make this anything you want. If you don't have second alarms that often, Stop there. Maybe that's your planning threshold. But this is a suggestion. 
gather the procedures from all the mutual aid departments that fit in that category. Just take a look. If you, you know, today, today, I, I used to do this in the manual mode. If you're doing it by computer, you know, do a word search. Do something like that and see if there's any common ground. And then try to create a new master document and see if you can get uh, any common, common areas among the chief officers or decision makers within the organizations that you're dealing with. I, I liken this to the, you know, I talk about consensus, and it's, uh, it's, it's 25 people ordering a pizza. Probably all we're going to end up with is a plain cheese pizza because that's what's going to please everyone. Uh, the good news is we're going to eat. The bad news is not everybody will get exactly what they want. So when you're doing this procedure review, uh, think about the greater good. There's, there's an awful lot of organizational triage going on here. Do the best for the many. Uh, and that's what interoperability really, really leads to. After you've done this mutual aid review with all your outside fire departments that might be responding, write down and brainstorm a list of responses that you might have in common with law enforcement and EMS. EMS, particularly if it's a third service. If it's within your department, it's a little less. You, you've probably already covered it with the previous review. But if you are a third service EMS provider or, or that's what's servicing your community, think about, you know, this is the auto accident. This is the violence situation. This is a hostage situation. You know, fire, police, and EMS would all end up at the scene. And then start looking at their procedures for those incidents and do that same review over again. This is how you begin to figure out what the, you know, this is the solution to the problem we posed at the first slide with interoperability. Uh, do these reviews of what incidents you have in common with the outside agencies. I, I tell this story often because it really made me crazy. Um, you, you've got the slide on the screen and I'm not going to, you know, read everything to you, but we were doing a planning drill that involved a hazardous, hazardous material situation, easy for me to say, uh, and law enforcement and, you know, one of these giant tabletop exercises that in the old days we used to call disaster drills for a very good reason because they usually ended up as disasters. But I was talking about my personnel entering the hot zone, and we were talking about hazmat, you know, so fire department personnel will do this, blah, 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 we'll enter the hot zone. So finally, one of the police captains from a state agency said to me, why are you putting your personnel in, in the hot zone? And I said, well, you know, that's what we do. We put on rubber suits and we go in the hot zone and we do hazardous materials. In his world, the term hot zone that I was using freely at the table meant the area where his sniper could take a kill shot. So it, just a silly example, but it's a very real life example my terminology of the term hot zone, I would speak in any firehouse across the country and almost everybody would know what I was talking about. When I crossed the boundary over to the police side of the house, it meant something entirely different to this uh, uh, police officer from a state agency who was a specialized officer. So it, the great example of how even our terminology can trip us up, uh, thus plain text, say what you mean the spill area. That's what we mean. Say what you mean, and it, it probably is going to reduce uh, some of those issues. So we'll do a couple more here, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a break for some questions. So we'll talk about the equipment piece. Review everybody's existing surrounding equipment. Take a look around you. If there is any way that departments can do joint purchases, then do it. Uh, now, that being said, Please don't wait to get every, well, I'm going to change every one of my air packs in my department and I'm going to wait for a federal grant. And the next department waits for a federal grant and the next department waits for a state grant. Stop the process. I agree you don't want mixed equipment within your own department or what have you, but we have to start somewhere. Because if we wait for the dollars to fall, the pennies from heaven as I refer to them, it may never happen. The other thing that you want to do is train with your neighboring department's equipment. I'm going to tell you a story here in a couple of minutes, a little bit later on, a case history where, you know, my firefighters, uh, where another department's firefighters were sent up my aerial. Well, you know, they had never set foot on it. They had never been on it. Uh, they had never really worked with it. Sure, an aerial is an aerial an aerial. But wouldn't it be great if somebody had already dealt with that 
and and it was a very very commonplace situation. Uh, we know that the you know the engine company pulls three three sides of the building, goes past that lease place for an aerial. My aerial happened to be in the best spot there was, but we didn't have all the resources. Our personnel off the ladder got sidetracked, so we needed somebody else to to work on our device. Have you thought about that? Again, my, my objective here is to make you think differently than you did when we started. And this is the thought I wanted to plan, uh, plant in your, in your mind, and that is train with your neighboring department's equipment. You're very familiar with your own. Train with theirs every once in a while, whenever you can. It's 2013. Uh, we have had instances here in the Northeast. It happens pretty regularly. Um, Hose sizes are not even the same. They should really come up with something like a national standard. Th oh, no, no, wait a minute. We have a national standard thread. Never mind. Um, it's not even the same. Uh, we have some uh, interesting, I border the state of Rhode Island. I'm here in Massachusetts. I border the state of Rhode Island. Uh, when we use forestry hose or brush fire hose or wildland interface hose or whatever it is you call it, we don't always use regular structural hose. We've got some single jacket stuff. In Massachusetts, it's an inch and an eighth in diameter with threads. In Rhode Island, it's inch and a half hose with quarter turn couplings. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. I've tried it. Doesn't work. Uh, iron pipe threads. Um, we had situations in a mutual aid department where they said, you know, bring your high rise pack to the scene and tie into this pumper. We go up with a high rise pack, we're trying to tie into the pumper. Wrong threads. Uh, extended lines. Hose threads are a big issue. There are places in the country where the hydrant is different. The hydrant connection is different. So, you know, these things, you may not solve them after today's webinar, but what you need to do is at least be aware of it. You don't want to find this out at the scene of an emergency. You've got to find that out ahead of time. So when you think about equipment and you're thinking about the first thing we need, what is the fire department's job? It's moving water. So, you know, hose, make sure you've got some sort of plan or have the adapters. A breathing apparatus, you know, changing bottles out at the scene of a fire. Somebody from a mutual aid department comes over and says, you know, we need a, a different SCBA bottle and they're not compatible. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. I think standardized, um, I think standardized uh, SCBA use in a regional, in a geographic area is helpful. No question about it. Uh, so I think that that's something that's important. Don't forget about EMS equipment. I, I don't want to, you know, we've got a number of people listening today. Paramedics, we've got everything. I have been on the highway at the scene of a multi-victim situation. Uh, ambulances arrive, people are being assigned, go to work, pick up a patient, put them on a stretcher, take them back to their truck. They're in a different stretcher or in a different truck and the brackets don't hold. And now we're playing musical patients because even stretchers weren't purchased common and even the stretcher brackets are different. So certainly that can be an issue. Think about the equipment that you don't normally think about. Hose, nozzles, all those things are pretty standard breathing apparatus. What about jaws of life? Uh, is it Hearst? Is it Amcus? Is it Homatro? If you're working jointly at the scene, can you swap a tool or a cutter? Is that even possible? Um, you know, make sure you know the answer. And while we're on equipment, we've got to talk about radios. And, and, and really, radios in and of itself, I kind of made a little bit of light. You know, it's not just about radios. But the fact is, interoperability from the radio perspective is changing. The technology is changing greatly. Uh, I once became, uh, I just took over in a department. And as I arrived, the police department was going to digital radios while fire was on analog. You know, how much of a problem does that cause? Can we talk to one another? Uh, is it the same type of radio? So you get to the scene of a, of a major alarm fire. Can you replace batteries? Now, I'm a firm believer as a chief officer, there are some people's batteries that you should not replace. Uh, that I digress for a moment. But, you know, do you have enough batteries? Well, we've got, we've got Kenwoods. You've got Motorola's. We've got a different brand, a different size. Uh, speaker microphones, are they, are they common? 
Um, somebody talked about, uh, there's someone in the, uh, you know, questions came up, but what about radio straps and wearing your radio and how do you, you know, do I wear my radio on a strap inside my gear? Do I put it in a radio pocket outside my gear? There's just been a report released just recently on the radios and where they should be carried. So those are all things that are important. In your own department, are your, is every radio channel program the same? Uh, we always think that the first all the way to the right and all the way to the left should be the emergency channel so that a firefighter in smoke can certainly figure out where he's going. What about if you respond to a bigger city and they have uh, tactical channels? Do you have those in your department, in your radios? Do you train with them? Are you training regularly using your radios with gloved hands? Uh, how often do you train with your, with your emergency button? Is that once a week, once a month, or do you never test it? Uh, these are all things, and, and the tactical radio channels are, are there. I would also ask you, you know, in a small department, a small call department, on-call department, even some city departments, you look down at a modern uh, digital radio today and try to figure out how to get to the other bank, the B bank, how to take your radio in and out of scan and get the tactical radio channel that you've been assigned to, that can be a challenge. That can be a real challenge. So when we talk about computer communication, I'll just leave you with a couple of things about the, the radio and communication in, in general. I think that it's important. If you can have a face-to-face -face discussion, that's important. Paper and, and, and the written word, that's interoperable. Um, if it's not a wide-scale emergency, uh, it's the telephone. You want, a, you want an interoperable device. We were discussing just prior to this webinar starting. We have departments from all around the country connected via a telephone line, and our sponsor happens to be Verizon, but nonetheless, it really doesn't matter who the sponsor is. You, we have connected a bunch of fire departments today online using the telephone as a concept. That's something completely interoperable, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. It's a good time for a break. I'll see if Peter's got any questions for us, and uh, I think we need to hear from Verizon at this point. Yes, Chief. Uh, again, thank you for the information so far. If you do have any questions uh, for, um, for Peter at this point, go ahead and send them in. We'll get to them in just a moment. Uh, again, a big thank you to Verizon Wireless for sponsoring today's webcast. Uh, Verizon Technology Boost collaboration that makes it easier than ever for organizations to share information remotely and in real time. Their advanced communication solutions enable interoperability so your station can exchange data with fire departments and public safety agencies, even across jurisdictions, to respond faster and keep the public safer. Uh, Chief, the, the first question I have for you uh, comes up. It's about um, uh, setting up talk groups and, and, and the radios, um, so it says, uh, when you talk about radios, what's the best way to set up a talk group? And who should be able to talk if we have six fire departments, three police departments, and a variety of groups uh, using those channels? Well, I, I guess we would, I would say maybe it's by task in, in my world. And, and, you know, again, this is one of those things that has to be discussed. I think command needs its own channel. Uh, they need to be monitoring something else. So I think a, a, a command group is certainly important. I think an operations group is important. And then I actually think in, in this case, you know, you're talking about uh, police and other, I think, there's a, I think there's a third group. And then you decide who's monitoring or cross-monitoring these various talk groups. But uh, in my world, I've run a lot of fire grounds and emergency scenes, and I think you know, there's really two ways to run every emergency. It's either by task or by place. And I think in this situation, you would have a command group, an operational group that's doing whatever they can do, and then maybe an interagency or something like that. So uh, certainly more to be discussed there, but I, that would be my short answer to that. Okay, great. Um, and uh, another Peter, uh, this is getting confusing now, um, he's, a, he's asking uh, even more basic, uh, do you recommend contact by the officers or chiefs? Um, not sure where we're going there. Contact, um, do you recommend contact by the officers or chiefs? I, I guess I would answer this question this way. I've run an awful lot of fire grounds, and we talk about incident command on the fire ground an awful lot. 
I find if you were listening to a scanner or listening to a mutual aid jurisdiction, it would never happen in your own department, so please listen to someone else's. But we end up with a lot of folks calling command. And I think we've really got to minimize who's calling command. If we're, if we're sectoring, if that's even the right word, but moving by divisions and groups, if we're doing that, then firefighters should be talking to their division leader or their task group leader, and only other communication should come to the chiefs. So I, I don't think that everybody uh, should be speaking to the commander at all times. But quite frankly, if you listen to uh, fire ground operations around the country, um, it, we find that that happens quite, quite often. Okay, and uh, going back to before you can even set up a talk group, uh, Brian here is saying that uh, regarding programming of radios, uh, the police dispatcher provides police and fire uh, communications. Uh, police radios are programmed with fire department channels, but fire radios aren't programmed with police channels. Uh, when the fire department asks to get the police channel access, they're told no. Um, how can we fix this? Yeah, any suggestions? Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, that is all too common a scenario. Uh, I think I would, uh, I would do a couple of things. I would try, um, you know, put the two department heads together. If that's where the collision is occurring, then maybe you've got to start with a police sergeant and a fire captain, fire lieutenant, or what have you. Uh, this really is not a – technologically, we know the radio can do anything we want it to do without question. Uh, our police gave us a couple of channels. They did not give us any sting channels. They did not give us any, uh, any of their tactical operation channels. But they gave us a couple of working channels that we could use. And the policy was, you know, it's forbidden. You, you fire guys don't talk on those radios unless there's an absolute need. So we talk about a couple of things. We talk about building relationships at, at whatever level it can be built. Um, usually a triggering incident is a great teaching, teaching point, a teachable moment. Uh, and, and we try to do that. But this is really a, a people problem rather than a technology problem. So I try to address it at several levels and try to use, you know, like a national incident, like these poor, poor firefighters uh, that were taken hostage down in the southern U.S. with Georgia, I believe they were taken hostage. You know, that's a great yeah. – so you send that email over to the police department and show them an example where this interoperability of radios might work. Great, and, and um, uh, Peter, who had the question before about the, the uh, chief level versus the officers, uh, said he actually sent the question in a little too early, so I'm going to I'm going to uh, post it back up here again. Um, it's uh, okay. uh, it says, um, uh, do you recommend chief levels uh, to start the system, or can line officers and firefighters start? The, uh, the interoperability uh, and talk group channel process. Uh, here's, yeah, here's what I would say to you about that. I, I think this should occur at whatever level you are in your department. You should leave this webinar today. If you're a firefighter, you should bring this up to your lieutenant and see what you do within your own department. I certainly don't want anybody doing anything outside the parameters of their normal operations. But if you're a company officer, then you try, to, you try to exercise this on your shift of group. So I think it, it can be organic. It certainly can come from the bottom up without much question at all. Um, obviously, I'm going to recommend chief to chief. That's the way I'm going to recommend it. And I think that the incident commander should be designating this in the real live incident. It should come from the incident commander first. But in terms of the concept and, and making it happen, that can come from the bottom up pretty easily. That would be my answer there. Okay. Um, I've got one more question here, and then we'll, uh, we'll kind of get back into the program itself. Um, um, it says, are all, are all agencies familiar with the federal frequencies available during multi-agency emergencies? Now, we use local tech channel until the incident evolves, and this becomes the command channel, and divisions are assigned to VTAC channels. Again, I guess that's all dependent upon the radio communication systems that you're on, but is that something you're familiar with? And do you have any suggestions or uh, opinions on that topic, Chief? I, I am familiar with it. I'm very familiar with it. And I, I think that my answer to you as I, as I travel around and do some teaching and talking to other firefighters, it's almost geography-based. 
Uh, it seems that the folks that have had major incidents, the hurricane areas, the tornado areas, they're very familiar with it. Uh, it seems to me that much of the fire departments are not familiar with the UTAX, the VTAX, and the ITAX. Um, and they're, they're not always programming their radio with those frequencies ahead of time, so obviously that makes it a moot point. You're not going to start programming radios. That is an excellent, excellent resource. Kudos to whoever brought that up. But I, I have seen, my experience has been that it's kind of a geography-based thing, uh, where people have had the need, they have programmed the radios, other people have not. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and get into the second half of the program here. And again, if you do have any questions uh, for Chief Lim, we will get to them um, as uh, as we finish up the, the next half of the program. So uh, we can go ahead, Chief. Thank you. I just want to leave you with this one uh, situation, and, and I talked about telephone just before the break, but I'm, I'm going to just uh, bring you in a, a little bit of a scenario. You should also think about if it's a large-scale emergency, I'm not talking about the working fire. I'm talking about the hurricane, the blizzard, the, 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 the uh, tornadoes, all of those kinds of things. You should think about the use of ham radios. Uh, they're not used to replace anything, but they are 100% interoperable. And, and my note here is the post-September 11th. After September 11th, uh, six or seven days after the incident, I actually went to New York, not as a fire chief, not as an EMT, not as an emergency management director, but I went there by way as a ham radio operator, and we were supporting the Red Cross. And we had hundreds of ham radio folks, and there was you know, federal equipment there, radio equipment. There was all kinds of radio equipment in this facility. And when we needed to communicate within this, with the Red Cross had taken over a municipal building. And when we needed to communicate, the guy who briefed me and put me in position said, if you need something, you write it with a pencil and a piece of paper and you put it out and we'll have a runner take it downstairs. And I was just overtaken by that in some way because there had to be millions of dollars of radio resources and equipment but the most interoperable way to deal with this was a pencil and paper. Uh, and there's, a, you know, there's an old joke around that uh, you know, the United States spent a million dollars on a space pen and the Russians used a pencil. Sometimes we can overthink ourselves when we're doing this. Uh, so two points there. Try to take this, when you're doing interoperability, do it at the lowest level possible. Make it no more complicated than it needs to be. And secondarily, the takeaway is, if you're not familiar with the capability of ham radio operators within your community to support your communications during a communications failure or during a large-scale incident, you shouldn't use them for routine day-to-day -day stuff, but you should build a bridge with your ham radio community out there. Uh, it's a tremendously valuable resource, which is truly interoperable from coast to coast. So it's something to think about about radios. A little bit about command, and we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, I mentioned Chief Gassaway before. I bring him back here. Who are your mutual aid commanders? Are they folks that are crawled up to the front door looking inside the front door? Are they folks that are sitting in uh, command posts uh, with clipboards? Uh, where are they? We refer to that as street or seat. Are they out there in the street, or are they in a fixed command post in a vehicle? That's going to make a difference on how this incident runs. The, the command theory or the command culture of your mutual aid resources will certainly make a difference in a large-scale emergency. We'll talk about some of these things, and we'll talk about whether it's a single commander or a command team. And again, some of this is geographic. You want interoperability among agencies? Begin to use checklists. Another one of the takeaways that we have in today's session, create some checklists of what needs to be done, what order it needs to be done, and begin to use those. Could you hand that checklist off to a mutual aid chief that's visiting you? Absolutely. Uh, priorities can all be predefined. There's continuity that will be maintained. You can hand off that checklist, and I know where you left off. You were up to number six. The first five things were taken care of. I'm a big proponent of checklists in the planning phase and in the actual response phase. I think it makes a difference, 
And I think it makes people, you know, what is the old phrase that we use? Are we all on the same page? Well, yeah, let's get on the checklist page, and then we will be all on the same page. So I think that's important. When we talk about unified command, I, I'm, I actually got this out of order, so I want to look at bullet two and, and the sub to that is this. If you're going to command a major incident, uh, I don't care if it's a dive operation, uh, whatever it happens to be, I think that there should be an incident commander, an accountability officer, safety officer, a senior technical advisor, a neighboring chief that you have a lot of faith in, and a couple of uh, firefighters to serve as aides, if that's possible. Holy crap, this guy's got more men in the command staff than I have going to the fire. Uh, yeah, maybe I do. But I think you've got resources around you. Um, and I think that the, the, if you needed more resources to fight the fire operations, if we're talking incident command operations division, if you needed more resources to support them, would you do it? You'd call them. If you needed more resources to support the function of command, would you call them? And most fire departments would say no. And I think that we have to realize that command is one of the five major functions, and it has to be staffed. And if you don't have the staff within your own department, then you, better, you, you are required to call that staff. And this is something that's a, 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 that we don't embrace, quite frankly. I, I would say this, this team that I explained, you know, there's people out in the Midwest and Southwest, uh, Southwest specifically, they do this all the time. They do this on a daily basis. Anybody listening who's on the webinar from there, nothing new to you. That's how they run the job on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that we all need to maybe expand our command capabilities uh, in what they do. If you do have a multi-discipline incident, you do need a, a, a designated person. Uh, I think about responding to a call, and uh, it was a large area that was involved. I pulled up and I said, where's the command post? And somebody pointed in one direction and said, the fire command post is over there, and the police command post is in an opposite direction. So I knew that that incident was not going to go exceptionally well. Uh, so that's there. Uh, use technology. I'm a big technology guy as long as it is not getting in your way. Uh, there are any number of, of resources out there to work a command system. There are you know, the iPad, uh, all sorts of tablet computers, anything that's out there I think is important. The other problem, when you bring multiple disciplines into a command post or a com unified command situation, you need to avoid information overload. You can really get so much data that you get overwhelmed. Everyone who comes to that unified command has to be refocused on what the mission is at the moment. Because if they're not, they will tend to slide within their own discipline, and you can get a ton of information that would, would uh, paralyze you, the old phrase that's overused, analysis paralysis. So advice, uh, avoid over-information and avoid the advice overload as well. There's a lot of talk. When I talk about unified command and large-scale command, we, we talk about what's the command vehicle? What are you in favor of? not in favor of anything. The answer is this. Bring a vehicle to the scene. Maybe you travel in your Suburban or your Ford Explorer or whatever your department has. Maybe you have the resources of a large-scale command post like we see on screen there. I think the point is this. You bring a tool or a vehicle to the scene that is going to get you information. Now, I certainly understand that you know, in a, you know, the field command post that's in the lower right of the slide, Sure, we want to get information out to state, regional, county officials. We push an information out. That's really not why I want the vehicle there. I want the vehicle there because it's going to bring me information. It's going to allow me to get data that's going to help me and the command team manage the incident. So in terms of command vehicles, I thought it deserved to slide and to be mentioned, but I think it's really something I take the perspective, bring me something to the scene that is going to help me and help me get information. That's what's important to me. We all have pre-planned map books, refer reference books in our apparatus. When you go to cover a neighboring community because they have a major incident, and you go and cover in their station, have you got their books? Probably not. They're, they're out on the apparatus. They're with their department out on the apparatus. 
uh, you need to think about how do, uh, you know, I think about a, a community I was involved with and, you know, we did not have a hospital in our jurisdiction. We would cover the neighboring community, which happened to be a city, and they had a hospital in their jurisdiction, and now we respond to the hospital with little or no information. So when we think about radios and the ability to talk to one another, we also need to take this down to a new level, and we need to think about horizontal data sharing. We need to share pre-planned data. We need to share where hazardous chemicals are. We need to share where elderly patients at risk are. Uh, lots and lots of data needs to be moved if you're serious about interoperability. Um, obviously, you can use you know, internet sharing, wireless sharing, all those kinds of things. But if you do that, you should also uh, make sure that the data is stored locally. If you carry computers in your apparatus, make sure that data is stored locally. Uh, we do know, uh, despite the best efforts of the best systems, uh, when, when Hurricane Katrina comes through and Hurricane Sandy comes through, we are going to lose some infrastructure or at least have infrastructure interrupted. If you fail to realize that, you're, you're kind of fooling yourself. But not only think about sharing words and sharing uh, equipment, I want you to begin to think today as you leave here about data sharing and how you do that and what tools and software is available to do that. Just very, very briefly about what's the difference between a command post and an EOC. You know, additional long term, I see an EOC for a large scale emergency probably that extends beyond the first operational period. If you're going to extend beyond 12 hours, I think you need to start to begin to think about an EOC uh, and, and, and additional information uh, will take place there. But your immediate concerns at a, at a command post is the you know, solving the problem. You know, in the, in the NFA uh, solution, it is, uh, you know, mitigation, hazard mitigation. Let's fix the problem. That's what takes place at the command post. So now let's, let's talk about, and as we get close here, let me, let's just talk about how does this really work in, in real life. So these are some of the things you could do in the planning process. Uh, see what the needs are, that gap analysis that we spoke about. And you know, when, when I look at bullet number three here, there's a couple of adjectives that are in that sentence that really should not be overlooked. Have meaningful working meetings with committed decision makers. You all and your mutual aid partners have to decide this is worthwhile. As a fire chief for many years, and if we have chief officers listening to us out there, uh, you go to chiefs meetings, you go to state chiefs meetings, county chiefs meetings, regional meetings. I'm talking about something completely different. I'm talking about a bunch of people rolling up their sleeves at working meetings and getting a cohesive group around you uh, to, to start this planning process. So the words meaningful, working, and committed are all important in that sentence. In, in my case, this is a very simple case, but it's something we did and I offer it out. You know, the local emergency planning committee, uh, with, you know, Sarah Title III, right to know law, tier two information, all of those kinds of things. One of the first things we did is we eliminated the fact that we all had individual LEPCs and we made it a regional emergency planning committee. That was the first logical thing for us to do. And if you know anything about LEPCs, that involves multidiscipline, it involves the local industries, it involves all of those things. So that was a piece of low-hanging fruit, if you will. That was an easy one for us to be able to do, and it brought a little bit of a cohesive nature to a lot of the community resources within a number of, uh, well, six communities as, uh, as we have it there. So that was a place that you might want to look as a, as a starting point, a little place to begin to generate some, some enthusiasm for this type of process that you need to take. Um, have your fire department work, you know, many fire departments listening to this webinar today have been called to stand by because the police tactical team has a hostage or what have you or something else. How, how hot does a stun grenade get? Can a stun grenade set a fire? Can, can this, you know, what are the needs? Get out there and train with your police officers. Uh, as, as you know, it was nationally broadcast uh, when we had the Boston bombings here. 
uh, there was a massive gunfight in a local community with an officer down, and paramedics had to work on an officer in some very, very difficult conditions. Boy, it would have been pretty neat if that had all been preplanned, and maybe it was. I don't know if it was or it wasn't, but they, I use that as a point of illustration. You know, how often have your paramedics worked around those kinds of hazards, and are they even familiar with them? Uh, that's a place to start for interoperability. Here's a case where we had. We could not be our own RIT team. If we had a working fire, our first alarm assignment was clearly going to be committed to the incident. So what we did is we took five departments from two states, and we brought everybody together in the train the trainer concept for RIT, rapid intervention, a fast team, whatever it is in your locale. That's how we approached it. We all got together and decided that's what we were going to do. And then we took a second step. We brought all the training officers together and we laid all of the RIT equipment out on the floor in an apparatus station and said, hey, that's a great idea. Let's, let's do that. Let's use a pulley system, put it in a bag, a four-to-one system, put it in the bag and have it all ready so we can do a, you know, a, a window lower with a ladder raise, high point anchor. Uh, so we did that. So we started with the, the problem. The problem was we couldn't be our own rapid intervention team. And so here's how we kind of worked through this and, and got through the problem and sort of the methodology. So we got this great RIT idea, and we were all, you know, high-fiving it, thinking we've got this resolved, and a lot of stuff was being done. And then we said, well, what about the commanders? If I can't be my own RIT team, then who is going to be the RIT team commander? Well, that's probably going to be a mutual aid officer as well. So we had to start talking about that and seeing where, where that process was going. So what we did is we got a bunch of committed people, and this took place, you know, it takes a little while to do this. You're not going to do this on a Tuesday afternoon. It takes a little bit of planning. Uh, we created a tabletop interactive exercise uh, using some command training. We put all the incident commanders in one place. We got a larger city department to come in and assist us with this training and, and do some work. And then we took it another level on a different occasion and we got um, a major fire ground simulator in there, which allowed 14 people to, to play various roles. We took that both from the incident commander down to the shift commander level and, and pushed the training down so that everybody was becoming more and more versed. And that's how we sort of kind of approached this. And then we took it another step, and we got, you know, if you're a large department, this certainly wouldn't apply. But we got our five closest mutual aid truck companies or ladder companies together, and we had a group session, and we reviewed them. What are the capabilities? What were the portable equipment capabilities? Now, there were some eyebrows raised when, you know, we had to take a couple of hours, and we pulled a bunch of aerials in a, in a you know, central location. And, uh, we, you know, there were some raised eyebrows to do this. You have to take some risks if you're serious about doing this. We made sure there was adequate coverage, and we made sure everything got done. But these are the types of things that I've done in real life that I'm trying to just give you a thought. I'm not suggesting that RIT is even your biggest problem for interoperability, but I'm trying to give you some thought process of, of what went down and how this might work. So, you know, I've got a couple of examples. Does it work? Well, yeah, I guess it does work. This. Uh, is actually that that slide should say transfer of command it's not reading right for me and uh, you see on the slide there what if the incident commander is the May Day uh, yes that is me uh, laying on the stretcher um, I wasn't the May Day per se because I never actually got the May Day out of my mouth I was the IC in a major incident uh, we had a second alarm fire it was uh, New England day. It's about 17 degrees, uh, snowing heavily. We had just had, you know, 20, 25 inches of snow. Uh, very, you know, everyone accuses me of that's why I collapsed at the fire, so I didn't have to work in those conditions, but that's really not true. Um, did have a sudden medical emergency, so I'm in command. People are calling me on the radio as command, and suddenly I was unable to answer. Unable to answer the radio. Uh, some of my, uh, one of my junior officers, my deputy fire chief was there at the time, but obviously he was in a different division operating at the incident. 
Uh, he, did, he doesn't know I'm going down. I have no way to say, oops, incidentally, transfer a command, yada, yada, yada. Essentially, I just collapsed. Uh, one of my captains took over uh, command, whether he was the ranking officer or not. He stepped in immediately and took over command. And we had a couple of mutual aid chiefs at this incident because we had decided previously that mutual aid chiefs would come into the scene and help. And this incident, in theory, you know, the incident commander felt it probably got much better after I left, quite frankly. But um, I collapsed at the scene, and there was no break in command. And, of course, the military tells you this all the time. It happens all the time. But I really believe that some of the planning and some of the work we had done uh, paid off in this situation. I think it came to fruition and paid off in this situation in great ways. Now, once this happened, uh, we doubled our planning efforts. We accelerated uh, in, in our efforts. Because I have to tell you, in all of my imagining and all of my playing what if, I never believed that this was going to happen. I never saw this one coming. And so we began to plan anew, and we began to accelerate our pace. So I think that that's important uh, to know. What do we do as we begin to summarize here? What do we do? This is the first bullet step. If you want to take this away, this is, the, again, yet another takeaway. Conduct an internal review with your command staff. When do you go mutual aid? Who operates with you on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis? And then start extending the concentric circles out. Determine how often that happens. And then figure out, hey, this happens a million times. We better take care of this. This happens twice a week. Uh, we operate with our police department several times a day at automobile accidents and ABC or whatever it is. Let's set your priorities. And the way to do priorities is the frequency and number of responses. Review all mutual aid equipment, resources, and personnel. If you're a fire chief, uh, don't delegate this task. Get out from behind your desk, go over mutual aid department, talk with their people, open their compartments, slam the doors, see what resources there are. Show the troops on the line that you're as interested in this process as anybody else, and I think that that will pay off dividends. But those are some things you can do immediately. I think you should start this at the command level. I think you should. Uh, that's the way I believe it to happen. Um, Figure out what, shake it out. Do a shakeout drill and find out what the topics and the priorities really are. Your priorities may be completely different from your neighbor's priorities. And I think that that's something you've got to deal with and figure out. Vitally, vitally important. Whatever training you take, whatever information you have during this interoperability process, take it down to a level below you. And as I just mentioned, this training is suitable from the firefighter on up. If you are a lieutenant, make sure your firefighters know what's going on. Captain, make sure the lieutenants, and, and so on. Uh, the information that's being received has to be passed down. Now, sometimes it'll be accepted, sometimes it won't be accepted, but that's not, you, you have a responsibility to pass it down. When you begin to implement and enact policies and enact these things, training has to take place at all levels. You saw how, de how determined we were to train our firefighters, train our training offices, and then we stepped it up to chiefs of departments and incident commanders to make sure that training takes place at all levels if you think that interoperability is going to work. And then just you know, expand the circles. I, I look at this as a bullseye, concentric circles. Just repeat the same process you went to, take it out to the region, take it out to the state, Take it where you need to. Now, here's the, here's the other thing. Like everything we do in the fire service, if you did this a year ago, you probably got to do it again this year. Uh, not to the same level of planning, but certainly the training has to be ongoing. Uh, personnel have retired, new members have joined, old members have, have left, and I think uh, it, it has to be ongoing and completely ongoing. This is a big deal among fire chiefs and police chiefs. You've got to put your ego in your pocket. It's, uh, you know, somebody said, I think it's a chief out of Canada that says this phrase all the time. It's not about the income, it's about the outcome. 
and everyone has to look at the only way we're going to survive in these economic times that we're all in, our resources are being stretched by the hour, and we are going to become more interdependent on one another within the community and on mutual aid communities, inter-community. So for the good of your agency, everyone has to participate at this level. And, and I would leave you with this. Truly interoperability is a mindset. It is a mindset. It, sure, it does standardize the method of operation, there's no question. I'd like to leave you with the people, procedures, and equipment method of, of solving things. And people should not be afraid of the word interoperability. Sometimes when I give this presentation, people will talk about, or I talk about the presentation, people say, oh, you're talking about regionalization. Uh, people will lose their jobs. I won't be the chief anymore. Things like, that's not what I'm talking about. There is no threat to turf or any of those other things. Um, it's, it's really about increasing the safety of your public that you protect, and more importantly, increasing the efficiency and the safety of the members that are out there protecting those people. I think that's what it's really about at the end of the day. So I'd like to leave you with that. I'd like to say thank you to everyone who uh, participated this afternoon. Uh, you can find me and hunt me down if you need more information. But uh, uh, that concludes the presentation. But I think we're going to take some questions. Peter, do you have any additional questions? Thank you to all that participated. Uh, yes, Chief, we do have a couple more questions that came in. Um, again, a big thank you, Chief Lamb, for putting this program together. You can see more from, uh, from the Chief at PeteLamb.com. Um, some of you had asked about um, viewing the entire program because you either went out or came back from a run midway during the program. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, this archived webcast will be available at firehouse.com slash webcasts, so you can uh, share that with other members of your department. Uh, and I think it's probably a good idea to share it with some of your neighboring chiefs if you're a chief officer, let them know uh, what you guys are looking at as far as trying to get everybody on the same page. Um, before we get to the final questions, Chief, I just uh, want to give a, uh, another thank you to Verizon Wireless for sponsoring today's webcast. Uh, this is the second one they've done with us, and uh, we appreciate them sponsoring these educational opportunities. Um, when responding to an emergency, you have to be ready to perform at the highest level possible with a slim margin for error. And Verizon enables mobile solutions that deliver critical information to firefighters for greater situational awareness for a faster, more unified response to emergencies. You can learn more about them at verizonwireless.com, or if you go to firehouse.com slash webcasts, uh, you can click on their banner ad, and that will take you right to their public safety page that provides you a variety of options for their public safety offerings. So again, a big thank you to um, Chief Lamb and to Verizon Wireless for sponsoring us. Okay, Chief, a uh, couple questions are rolling right now. Uh, the first, I think this is the golden uh, ticket. If you answer this, you can fully retire to an island someplace. Uh, what would you suggest if your departments aren't willing to work together? Uh, in my area, certain chiefs do not get along nicely, as nicely as they should. Uh, several folks pose the same question, but in different ways, uh, whether it's getting on the same channels, drilling together. Um, obviously, interoperability doesn't just happen uh, by filling out a couple forms. So any suggestions to help uh, firefighters or officers really get this going? Yeah, I, I, you know what, that is a, it, it's unfortunate that we even have to discuss that problem, but it is a real world problem in today's day and age. There's no question. Um, I would say begin to build the bridges at the lowest level. Uh, if, you're in a, if you're in a department where you, you know, you're, a, you're an engine lieutenant, go meet with another engine lieutenant from another department. I do think this about a lot of things. Training is the answer to get this to work. And I begin to think, if you begin to share ideas, if the top level is not going to get this done, work it at your level and begin to share ideas like, um, you know, go, go to Firehouse. I mean, I, I, all of the people that are on this webinar probably check websites every day. Uh, share a case history with that neighboring lieutenant. Hey, did you see what happened in XYZ community last week? Man, that could happen to us. How do we make this work? And, and it takes much, much longer, but I have seen organizations successfully uh, you know, make this work from the bottom up 
even to some degree. Um, and, and so that's my encouragement. And, and fight the good fight. This is not going to happen overnight, as you well point out. And certainly uh, it, it takes time. But if you're an engine company lieutenant, you do whatever you can do in your department at an engine company lieutenant's level to make this work and reach out to your surrounding communities. Use case histories where interoperability would have, you know, the, the best ones to use are where it was a success, uh, where it worked effectively. You know, we talked about the Boston bombings. I mean, there was a situation, the Boston Marathon is planned beyond any other, you know, event that I know. That thing is all planned out ahead of time. And by and large, it was a pretty successful operation using multiple agencies, multiple police agencies, multiple fire agencies. So I think training is a key and using successful case histories and sharing them. In the old days, it was hard to move information. Firehouse is a tremendous source of moving information, and you can find uh, a dozen resources of why interoperability worked and examples why it didn't work, and begin to sharing those with your neighbors. And eventually, you know, somebody will take this up to the chief level and uh, it, remove the threat. Remove the threat from the chief level. Hey, listen, I, I know you don't like Chief XYZ, and you really don't have to like him, Chief, but if you want to if you want to help us, we're, we're trying to do the right thing here, Chief, and it would make us safer if we went over to Tuesday night drill night with them. It would make us all a little safer, and we would appreciate you doing that. Boy, I've got to tell you, it'd be hard-pressed if Chief uh, answered that one in a negative way. Uh, so it, it is a problem. Uh, I'm not going to get the trip to the island just yet, but uh, start it organically from the bottom. Use training, use case histories, and share information. Well, uh, close enough. I'll see if we can uh, get a ticket order up for you, Chief. Um, <laughs> next question here is, um, it says, how do you recommend off-site storage of pre-plans, emergency plans, and evacuation planning to keep from losing the intelligence if your community becomes a part of the emergency? Well, there's a number of cloud-based solutions. But again, uh, one of the solutions that I'm intimately familiar with, um, uh, not really going to talk about it here, but if, if you have your mutual aid data in your laptops and your computer system, you have the cloud as a backup. But if the other community also has your data, that's why I said if, if, if your department was wiped, yeah, hey, your headquarters burns down or whatever happens, catastrophic you know, tornado rips up your fire headquarters, your neighboring department on their computer would have all of your data. Bingo. A thumb drive, a, a, a download to the cloud, and your data is, is there. So there are a number of software solutions. I think the cloud raises some excellent potentials now, but I think multiple copies of locally stored data are critical, and uh, uh, there are solutions out there that do that. Chief, great, thank you. Um, I, I think we're all wrapped up. A majority of the questions um, were kind of duplicates. So. Um, again, thank you to everybody for joining us today. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Please be sure to share this. Uh, you can uh, learn more uh, about the uh, archive, or you can share the archive at firehouse.com slash webcasts. Uh, you can learn more about Pete at petelam.com, a wonderful uh, training resource uh, website. And again, Verizon Wireless, a big thank you, um, verizonwireless.com. And if you go to firehouse.com slash webcasts, you can get a direct link to their public safety uh, section of their website where they have a wealth of resources that they can uh, share to help uh, your department get the technology up to the level that is needed. Uh, Chief, thank you, and thank you to everybody for listening, and we'll see you again pretty soon here on Firehouse Webcasts.